our sanctuary, does it not look gorgeous? And we have a very special lady to say thank you to, but she won't like this, but Sue and Charles. Oh, she's not up there. Where are you? Oh, there she, there she is. It looks so pretty. Well. Okay, uh, first and foremost, again, we are thrilled you're here. And please, even if you're a member, would you please fill out this connection card? And I know that our staff is very, very diligent and faithful to pray for all of us. And I don't hardly know one person that doesn't have a need. So if you could fill this out, and visitors, please fill out the front. And then if you have prayer requests, then you can fill it up, put that in the back, and then put it in the offering plate when it's passed around. And we sure appreciate that. Okay, Replenished Ladies Retreat is going to be March 2nd through the 4th. It will be in Junction this year. And make plans now to attend. And, of course, there will be more information following. Okay, our church Christmas open house. That's always fun. It's Tuesday, December the 12th, from 10 a.m. until 2 p.m. We invite all the staff from Crockett Elementary, along with our church family, to come enjoy some holiday fun and hospitality. We will need your help again this year. Yum, yums. If you could help by providing or preparing food, Christmas desserts, and hosting that day. Well, I might be doing that. We would appreciate it. If you can help, please contact Erica Miss. Where is that Miss Erica? All righty. Thank you, Erica. Also, on that note, uh, we have a Crockett uh, Ministry Committee or team, and Susan Johnston is our chairperson, and Susan and Lynn Reese and Lori Winkler and Jerry Etheridge made Christmas ornaments yesterday. And we will give each and every st uh, staff member over at Crockett a beautiful, it's, uh, they're made out of cinnamon. And so it'll be wonderful that for them to hang it on their tree or whatever. So, and then they will be there. But we sure do want to thank Susan. She puts a lot of time and effort into it and all the other people on there. Okay, Christmas weekend services. There will be no Sunday school on December the 24th, but we will have our regular morning worship service at 1045. Then Sunday evening, we will have a special Christmas Eve service at 5 o'clock. Make plans to bring your entire family, and please check your bulletin for other special events happening this holiday season. Yes, this is more than just pretty. There is so much wonderful information in there, and we appreciate that. Uh, coming up, this is just a little heads up, and if you just have need more information than I'm giving you, you can speak with Mr. Kelso. Uh, we have D Now, which is Disciple Now, and it's a citywide event for uh, Youth? All righty. And that's January the 19th through the 20th. And we need some host families. So if you could be thinking and praying about it, and uh, you'll host them in your home. And if you need more information, he is not hard to find. Okay, I know you guys are sorry. I, I'm finished. And now the mic goes to Scott Steele. Good morning. If the following people would be kind enough to join me up here, uh, Philip Cross, Michael Mary, Michael, <laughs> Mike, Mike Mariano, Justin, Maggie, Gary, Sue, Cole, and Andrew. Uh, if y'all would come down, please. Don't be shy. I haven't bitten anybody all week. Uh, this is great, great. 
Yeah, I saw it on your record, though, on the, oh, no. I'm just, just, <laughs> just, just kidding, just kidding. Thank you, Kelso, sorry. Um, we appreciate uh, the congregation's generosity. Every year we take up a uh, offering to share with the staff so we can, just a way of to demonstrate our appreciation for them. And uh, we appreciate uh, all that they do weekend and uh, week out. Uh, Seth is going to run the envelopes up to the guys up, uh, to Mike and Eric up there. Didn't forget you guys. It's just I, my knees can't get me up the stairs very quick anymore. So anyway, so we appreciate all that these guys do uh, year in and year out. Uh, Philip, Mike, uh, yeah, sorry. Kelso. Andrew. <laughs> okay. We appreciate you guys so much. God bless you. Gambaru. <laughs> Roughly translated, the Japanese word means to tough it out, to overcome obstacles, to persevere, to press on through tough times, focusing on the importance of finishing a task and never stopping until a goal is achieved. Who would have thought that a southern girl from Alabama and a farm boy from Missouri would end up in Japan and find this to be our story? People told us, you can't get into the hospitals, you can't get into the schools. And God has opened doors for us to go in and minister. People told us, you're not going to be able to get into the orphanages. God has opened doors for us to get in and minister to the orphans. <laughs> People told us, it's going to be difficult to adopt. God has blessed us with a son and a testimony of his faithfulness. People told us it's going to take years for you to see fruit in Japan. And what we've got now is something only God could have accomplished. One amazing thing that God has done this last year is open the doors for us to start a church plant in our pediatrician's office. We met Dr. Shimizu when one of our children was sick. Come to find out Shimizu Sensei was also a believer who had a heart to use her business and her clinic to reach out to the Japanese people. Japanese do not readily enter churches, so even if the gospel is shared inside the church, most Japanese will not have a chance to hear the gospel. However, hospitals, schools, nursing homes, and other things like this always have people coming to them. If in those places they are able to encounter the gospel, then lots of Japanese will have an opportunity to hear the gospel. So that's what we're seeing at the church plant, is that people are coming in and they're seeing new life. They're seeing people's lives who have been changed by the gospel, and they realize there's something missing in their own. They realize there's something that they need in their own life, and they're beginning to be drawn to the love and grace of the gospel. I always felt something was missing before. After knowing God, I always feel a sense of security in my heart. Even though I have everyday worries and problems, I always talk to Jesus honestly, and He gives me peace. I guess what makes me emotional about seeing lives change is it's nothing I can do. God calls us to be obedient, but really the work is totally dependent upon Him and what He has planned. It makes the hard days worth it to be able to see Him really, truly working. We are overwhelmed 
by the work of God's grace in our lives. We know that the only hope for the people of Japan is the message of the gospel. And it's because of that we're compelled to continue working in this country. This is the time of year when we focus on the Lottie Moon Christmas offering for international missions. And part of the bulletin that you have today is the pamphlet for this week where um, some of the international missionaries are highlighted. And one of them was the Jones family in um, Japan. But I'd like to pray through this week's missionaries this morning and invite you to continue to use this pamphlet through the rest of this week to again pray for these specific families and ministries that are highlighted um, and for the thousands of other international missionaries that we as Southern Baptists through the International Mission Board are privileged to be able to support. So pray with me if you would. Heavenly Father, we want to lift up the Bagby family um, in Nepal. This is a place that is very um, mountainous, very hard for this family to reach, um, the, the 28 um, people groups in their area. So, Father, we pray for them to have safety as they travel, for them to have endurance, and that the time that they are able to spend with the folks around them, um, they will be able to show your love and your blessings to the people of Nepal. Father, we also lift up the Muslims in Russia. Mus Muslims, we know, are um, immigrating to lots of different parts of the country, and specifically in Moscow. There um, are now huge mosques and huge groups of Muslims who need to hear about the love of Jesus Christ. So we pray that the ministry that you've gathered there of Christians will be able to reach out to the Muslims. And then, Father, the Jones family in Japan that we saw in the video, specifically, they are having incredible um, results through the adoption of their Japanese son and for the birth of their own child that's coming up. So, Father, we ask that you continue to bless them in the relationships that they're building. And, Father, I'll also lift up Rocky and Marla, the couple that we also support in their um, Japanese ministry. Father, next I want to mention the Mexico City team. You have gathered an eclectic group of International Mission Board missionaries there. And they have been given the privilege to reach out to an eclectic group of people who are gathered in this huge city in Mexico. So I ask that you specifically match up the gifts and the strengths of the team that you've gathered there and that they will be able to reach out in specific ways to the folks that you've put them in contact with. Next, Father, in our pamphlet, we're asked to remember the forgotten refugees. We have missionaries in tiny parts of the world where um, there are groups of peoples, especially in the Middle East area, um, in the Northern Africa area, where, there, where people have been removed from their home. And these refugees have a hard life, Father. So I pray specifically that the hard times that they're being asked to endure will open their hearts to the love and to the blessings of Jesus Christ and that they will see the true purpose of life on earth is not wealth or ease, but to know you and to grow closer to you. Father, in London, you've put a Makeska family and they open their home to the um, various ethnic groups that are in London. London is a very diverse city these days and they specifically are open to um, gathering folks into their home, into their kitchen. And I ask that you will um, give them the resources to be able to do that and that the unique connections that are happening um, around their family table will be a blessing as others see Christ. And um, finally, um, Lord, we're gonna lift up this morning um, the people that you are touching directly through dreams. And that's happening all through the world. We've heard stories of that from many different parts of the world. 
But I pray, Father, that as you put um, dreams and hope, true hope of life, eternal, in the hearts of people, that there will be a believer that will be able to help them interpret that dream, to show them who God really is, and that whether it's a missionary that's there or whether it's the result of missionaries' work, but that there will be a Christian um, in every corner that can help answer questions and continue to bless and to mature believers in Christ. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to support these missionaries. It's in Christ's name I pray. Y'all stand with me, please. I'm reading from Luke chapter 2. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find the baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Y'all pray with me, please. Father in heaven, we, we thank you so much for Christmas that you've sent your son. We thank you for your blessings. Lord, you are benevolent. You are kind to us. And Lord, you've given us grace when we didn't deserve it. Lord, we just thank you for our salvation. Lord, we, we pray for our leaders today. We pray for our nation. We pray for repentance and revival. Lord, that you would bring men and women everywhere to fall on their knees and to confess their sin. Lord, that our nation as a whole would turn to you. Lord, we know that would be, this would only be through your work, the work of your spirit and the preaching of your word, the preaching of the gospel. Lord, we pray that our nation would end the evil practice of abortion. That you would allow us, Lord, the grace to do this legislatively. But Lord, we also pray for your mercy on us that as people reap what they sow, Lord, a nation will reap what they sow according to your word, Lord. I just pray for your mercy on us. We pray for our president and his family, President Trump, for their salvation. And that you will surround him, Lord, with believers who give him wise counsel and we show him the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for our Congress, our judicial branch. Lord, your, your word said that he who says to the wicked, you are righteous, people will curse him, nations will abhor him. Lord, I pray for righteousness and justice to be done in our country. Lord, we lift up these missionaries again to you, Lord, that we are ministering to and partnering with. Lord, we just pray that the gospel would go out. Lord, we also know from your word, Lord, that you have said that we still sin. And I pray, Lord, that we would be a confessing people, that you would pierce our hearts and our consciences through the work of your Holy Spirit of when we do wrong, Lord, and that we would confess. And Lord, we thank you for the promises of your word that if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you would use these next couple of seconds, few seconds to confess your personal sin to the Lord as we bow together and to God.
Father in heaven, we also lift up our requests to you. Lord, we know that you are the great physician and that you are sovereign over all things, Lord. We pray for our brother Jordan Fisher, Lord. We pray for his physical healing, for Barbara Race, for Mary and Bledsoe, for their healing, Lord. We thank you for the good news for Tanya Boyette this week, but Lord, we continue to pray for her, Lord, that you'd heal her body. And we thank you for this surgery. Lord, we pray for Sophia Elder, Peggy Little, for their health. And Lord, we also lift up Lacan's American father, Wallace Bruce. Lord, we pray for him today. We pray for Martha Clifton, for Cindy Hickey. Lord, we also lift up Michael Wren's father, James, for his health. Lord, we pray for Jack Achilles, Lord, and for Sandra, for Jack's healing. And Lord, we pray for Alex Tipton and Skeeter and for Linda O'Donnell. Lord, you know all needs before we even ask you, but Lord, we come to you as our king and our sovereign. Lord, we just lift these things up to you. So now if you'd spend the next few moments what God has laid on your heart to pray about for your personal family and health needs and physical needs and use this time to pray to him. God, we celebrate this season, the coming of Jesus. Thank you so much for the gift of sending him. I pray that we would, God, just remember that today as we sing, remembering Jesus. Let's stand together and remember the Savior who's come. Silent night, holy night, all is come. so tender and mild sleep in heavenly peace sleep in heavenly peace a silent night a holy night shepherds quake at the sound seen from heaven above heavenly oh sing alleluia Christ the Savior is born Christ the Savior is born let's remember him sing it together a silent night oh Son of God, love's pure light, radiant beams from thy holy face, with the dawn of redeeming grace, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. Sing it together this morning, rejoicing at the first Noel. The first Noel, the angel did say, was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay, in fields where they lay, keeping their sheep. On a cold winter's night that was so deep singing Noel, 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 come on, born. 
one is the king of Israel. Let's sing this story together. They looked up. They looked up and saw a star shining in the east beyond them far and to the earth it gave great light and so it continued both day and night singing no baby just like us in a impoverished family kind of in the middle of nowhere he was the word of God born amongst us and he still speaks to us today left us his word sent us his Holy Spirit to remind us of all the things he said and teach us all things new and so when we celebrate the baby this season we don't celebrate a baby we celebrate the coming of the Messiah the word of God amongst us. The Savior has come. And so we're just going to remember that, that the last verse, I love it, of that, that song. And with his blood, mankind hath bought. It's the life of Jesus. He came to rescue us from sin and death and give us life in him. So let's just celebrate him this morning. The word of God, who's beautiful, beyond compare. So just from your heart today, let's remember him. Sing it together, beautiful. Beautiful are the words spoken to me. Come on to Jesus, sing it. Beautiful is the one who is speaking. From your heart, tell him. Beautiful are the words spoken to me. Jesus, beautiful is the one who is speaking, coming close, coming close and speak, coming close, come closer to me. To me. So beautiful, the beautiful is the one who is speaking. Jesus, the beautiful are the words spoken to me. Come on, tell him, sing it. The beautiful is the one. Who is speaking? 
coming close coming close and speak coming close come closer to me and the power of your words are filled with grace and mercy let them fall on my ears and break my stony heart the power of your words are filled with grace and mercy let them fall on my ears and break my stony heart coming close coming close and speak coming close come closer to me closer to me coming close coming close and speak tell me coming close come closer to me closer to me and the power of your words Filled with grace and mercy, let them fall on my ears and break my stony heart. The power of your words, I'm filled with grace and mercy, let them fall on my ears and break my stony heart. I'm coming close, I'm coming close and speak, I'm coming close. Closer to me. So Jesus, come speak to us now. Pray you, through your word filled with mercy and grace and love, you would challenge our hearts to see who you are and cause us to live lives that reflect the gospel, the good news of why you came well. So we sing for your glory, remembering you and what you did. For your sake, amen. Good morning. Merry Christmas, right? Merry Christmas. Um, I guess this is the season of Hallmark movies, right? <laughs> a lot of you may know, you know, Philip Cross and my wife share a great love for Hallmark movies. <laughs> And I, I think I told the story, some of you have heard a few weeks ago, I was taking a semi-nap on the sofa and I woke up and it was Lee Majors in a Hallmark movie. <laughs> and and I, it just ruined it for me. I said, man, that's the $6 million man. <laughs> I couldn't bring myself to watch it. Anyway, Lee Majors, man card revoked, right? <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, what a wonderful time. Um, Merry Christmas. Um, I was thinking this week that most of you know I, I spent a lot of time coaching basketball. I uh, was in college basketball for 28 years. So I'm still going through changes. I guess you could call them withdrawals if you want. But oftentimes as a coach, I would sit in a game. And for those of you familiar with sports, you kind of know where I'm coming from. But I would always have maybe one guy on my team that would take an ill-advised shot. Have you heard that term before? You know, he shouldn't shoot. That's a bad shot. You know, that's a contested shot. Pass the ball to the open man. A pretty simple game, right? Well, I would sit on the bench, and a guy would come down the floor, and i said, say, no, 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 and it would go in. <laughs> and I would say, and I'd look at my assistant coach, uh, Kenneth Mangrum, here recently. I'd say, you know, i said, Merry Christmas on that one, <laughs> you know. Uh, guy might be dribbling down the floor and we might have our best defensive player all of a sudden uh, tackle a guy from the other team. I would call it a tackle or a sideline tackle. And I said, oh, why in the world would he do that? And then all of a sudden the ref would blow his whistle and signal a travel violation on the other team. <laughs> and I'd look down at Kenneth and I'd go, Merry Christmas on that one. <laughs> but, you know, because it was a gift. It was a gift given to us, and because of the great love and benevolence and long-suffering and kindness and probably pity 
of that referee. <laughs> we were able to live to coach another day, I guess, if you want to say that, or maybe win the game. And, of course, you know, great coaches will say that any, a lot of them will say when they lose games, maybe behind closed doors, well, it, they might blame it on the officials. But I often said Merry Christmas in basketball games. And I know the other people probably down on the bench would hear me, and they, they knew exactly what I was saying because things would happen that were just, that were gifts, that were unmerited favor of the sovereign official, <laughs> if you want to call it, undeserved grace, and things turned out usually for the better. Well, that's where we are here at Christmas time, and it's a, it really is, like the song says, the most wonderful time of the year. Um, we said this morning in Sunday school, this is the moment uh, really that the earth was, that the world and that humanity was created for, for Christ to come, you know, a sovereign God, perfect in his foreknowledge, knowing way in advance that when he created the world that man would rebel against him and sin and that he would send his son to die for the sins of the people. And yet, as we see from the text we're going to look at today, that he... It was to the glory of God the, God the Father, to the glory of his mercy, to the glory of his patience, to the, to the glory of all of his attributes that you see even at the cross. Some theologians have said that the world was made for the cross, an instrument of crucifixion. Isn't that something? An instrument of torture, that the world was made for that. Well, before we dive in, there's kind of an intro here. We're going to look at Philippians 2, which is a great Christmas passage, but you see today in our culture, I don't know if you've noticed, there are even more of them here recently, a, a lot of books, um, I think even movies about people that have died and gone to heaven and come back down and t tell their story, uh, near-death experiences. You know, Paul speaks in Corinthians of not knowing whether he was out of body or in body, but seeing things that he could not speak of, unspeakable things in the third heaven. He speaks of himself actually in the third person. You know, John speaks of his visions of heaven. But I tend to take everything within our culture that our culture sends a, to us with, you know, the words of Christ. And John 3 said, uh, he, you know, Christ says to Nicodemus, he says, we, we speak to what we know and we testify to what we see, but still you people do not accept our testimony. And he was speaking of the nation of Israel. He said, I've spoken to you of earthly things and you don't believe, Nicodemus. Israel doesn't believe. I've spoken to you of earthly things. How will, you believe I speak, how will you believe if I speak to you of heavenly things? And then he said something interesting. He says, no one's ever gone into heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the Son of Man. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the Son of Man. Basically saying that he was the authority to speak of heavenly things. But he came down that Christ would take on flesh, as Micah mentioned this morning, that the Word of God, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Uh, Lacan always quotes Peterson. He moved into the neighborhood. He tabernacled among us. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the Son of Man. Um, Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy, we've just finished 1 Timothy in Sunday school, he, he quotes what many people think is an ancient church hymn. He said, uh, he appeared in a body, 1 Timothy 3, he appeared in a body. He took on flesh. Incarne, incarnate, carne, meaning with flesh, incarnation, not a creation, that Christ is not a created being, but he appeared in a body. And then he said he was vindicated by the Spirit, or he was declared righteous by the Spirit of God because the grave couldn't hold him. He was raised up. He appeared in a body. He was vindicated by the Spirit. And he, Paul said he was seen by angels. You know, there's a lot of talk about angels at Christmas time. They hark the herald angels sing. But Christ was seen by angels. The, the angels announced his coming. He was seen by the unholy angels. You know, as they said, as he cast out the demons, we know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Christ was seen by angels. Peter says that even angels now long to look into the work of the Holy Spirit, to the work of Christ in salvation, in the preaching of the gospel, 1 Peter chapter 1. But he was seen by angels. He appeared in a body. He was vindicated by the Spirit. He was seen by angels. He was preached among the nations. 
He was believed on in the world, and then he was taken up in glory. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the Son of Man. What a great hymn. And that's really a picture of the gospel there in 1 Timothy 3, starting with, He appeared in a body, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We live in a culture now where Christmas time can also get, I don't know if y'all see it, but it gets bizarre. And that's the, morning, the word I use this morning in Sunday school. There's a lot of bizarre things. So it's good for us as the body of Christ to go back to the Word of God and to contemplate the true meaning of Christmas, that He appeared in a body, that Christ was preexistent that he's eternal, that he's always been here and he always will be. He had no beginning and he has no end. But if you would, turn to Philippians chapter 2. And before we go into Philippians 2, I'm going to pray for us here. Father in heaven, we thank you again for Christmas. Every good and perfect gift is from you, Lord. Every precious and good and perfect gift is from you coming down from you. And there is no greater gift than the gift of your Son and the gift of our salvation. And in this we greatly rejoice. I pray, Lord, that at Christmas time we would teach our children well what Christmas means. That you would protect us from the message of the world. That, yes, we have symbolism at Christmas. We have trees. We do all these other things, Lord, but I pray that our focus would be on your Son. His humbling of himself, the humility of Christ in a world that tells us to esteem ourselves. I pray, Lord, that we would remember the humble Christ who set aside his privileges, who took on a body and was obedient even unto death death on a cross, and that as your word tells us, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered as a son. Lord, teach us from your word, guide us, Lord. We, we also today, Lord, lift up Reagan Stevenson. We pray for her health. We pray for her family, and we thank you for her. Please heal her body. In Christ's name, amen. For those of you who don't know, I, I think I was scheduled to preach. Yes, I was scheduled to preach next Sunday. And uh, Rex was scheduled today, but y'all keep Reagan in your prayers. Uh, I don't think he minds me sharing. He may be viewing today, but Reagan has pneumonia. And Stacy's in Israel, so it's not like she can just come home. But pray for them. And um, got to see them yesterday, and Reagan was all smiles. But uh, if y'all could pray for them. Before we look at Philippians 2 here, I just want to read just a few verses that I've wrote down to kind of get us in a context of what the Christmas message means. Just when you see that little baby Jesus lying in a manger, and I think I said last year up here at Christmas time that it's not, uh, it's not Ricky Bobby Jesus, okay? <laughs> and by the way, I haven't seen that movie. I did see that clip, though. Will Ferrell, <laughs> okay? This is the incarnate Son of God lying in the manger. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Without Him, nothing was made that was made. Christ, without, without Christ, nothing was made that was made. Colossians 1, He's the image, Christ is. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him, all things were created. In heaven, and on earth, visible and invisible things. Christ created the microscopic things. Thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. Christ created the angelic realm. He created Lucifer. Christ created the angelic realm. Thrones, dominions, principalities, powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. Christ holds this universe together everything together and he came at just the right time when God wanted him to call come when the fullness of the time had come God sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law 
like we were. We're born under the law. We were born of women. Born of, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law. To fulfill the prophecy of Genesis 3 that Lacan quotes week after week after week. The proto-evangelion. The first evangelizing. The first gospel. The seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. Hebrews chapter 1, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. He makes the sun come up in the morning. That's what Briley said. Jesus makes the sun come up in the morning. He sustains all thing by, things by his powerful word. 1 John chapter 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. Speaking of Christ, we've actually touched him. This we proclaim to you concerning the eternal life. The life appeared, we have seen it, and we testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life. The eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We write this to make our joy complete. So Christ didn't come into existence in Bethlehem. Right? Amen? He's pre-existent. He's always been here. He always will be. No beginning, no end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. One more. John chapter 12. <laughs> this is incredible. John says, he quotes Isaiah. He says, therefore, speaking of the nation of Israel, he says, therefore they could not believe for he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should hear with their hearts. In turn, I would heal them. And he spoke this of the nation of Israel. And he said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. In the next verse, John 12, 41 says that Isaiah said these things when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Isaiah saw the glory of Christ and spoke of Christ, what, 700 years before Christ was born? Had a, before Christ's incarnation, Isaiah saw the glory of Christ, speaks to the eternality of Christ and to the judicial hardening of the nation of Israel by Christ. So Christ was working long before he came to this earth. Right? Amen? Peter says in 1 Peter that the Spirit of Christ predicted the sufferings of, his, of Christ and the glories that would follow. The Holy Spirit working the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of holiness, the third person of the Trinity all working before Christ had an incarnation, before he took on flesh. So let's look at that. Let's look at Philippians chapter 2. And uh, not to carry on, but just, I missed something here. The words of Christ. Christ exhibits omniscience often, even though he lays aside some of his power. He lays aside his privileges. But John 2, Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. Jesus, therefore, knowing their thoughts, Jesus knew from the from the beginning, who, who they were who be, would betray him and who, believe, who would believe in him. Peter, go throw your line into the sea and put your hook in the fish and the first fish that you catch, take out the coin and pay our temple tax. Omniscience. The Son of Man must go into Jerusalem, be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, put to death. Foreknowledge. For as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man must be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He exhibits omnipotence, power over the winds and the waves. Who is this that calms the winds and the waves? The disciples said. He heals the blind, he heals the lame. Power over nature. Power over the grave. The grave could not hold him or anyone else, if he wanted to raise them. What's Lacan always say? It's good that he said, Lazarus, come forth. If he hadn't said Lazarus, all the graves would have opened. Power over the grave. 
Yes. Christ said, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Christ said, before Abraham was born, I am. Christ told the disciples, when he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. The eternality and the preexistence of Christ. Just some of his words there. Philippians 2. Paul says to the Philippians, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. And really, the subtitle in my Bible is, here is imitating the humility of Christ. The humility of Christ that he was humble. Sunday school class, what does humility mean? Lowly what? Lowly-mindedness. Is that opposite of what we see in our culture today? Our culture of self-esteem? Lowly-mindedness, Paul says, not to speak... Not to think more highly of the, ourselves than we all at Romans chapter 12. Um, and yet we're told to love ourselves by the culture. Being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Wow. Go preach that over here across the street. You guys need to humble yourselves. You think you'll get somebody to throw a rock at you? <laughs> humility. Humility, lowly-mindedness. By the way, not to preach another sermon, but it's what I said this morning in Sunday school. That ties in to, to what our culture is now saying, this cultural Christianity, that God, di God died for, sent his son to die for me because I'm just so valuable and I'm just so worthy and I'm just so wonderful. Hmm. No. But in humility, consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. Loving others as you love yourself. Loving your neighbor as you love yourself is not a mandate to love yourself. It's a given. It's assumed we already do love ourselves. And we do, regardless of what the psychologist will tell you. Uh, Paul says in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves. He doesn't speak of that as being a good thing. Job abhors himself and repents in dust and ashes. Paul says, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? No, but also the interest of others. And then verse 5, our attitude, your attitude, Philippians, should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And I want us to look at about five things today from this passage in the attitude of Christ. If anybody ever had a right, he had a heavenly right to, be, to have pride, to be proud, proudful. But your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus, who, verse 6, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, verse 7, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The first thing I want us to look at is that Christ gives up his glory. You could say he, he abandons, in a way, he abandons his sovereign position. He still may exhibit sovereignty over things of nature. He can calm the winds and the waves. He can raise the dead. He can heal the lame and the blind. He can feed the 5,000. He can multiply little sardines, right? He's like a walking golden corral, right? <laughs> but he lays down. He lays down his privileges. He gives up his glory. Um, one of the things Christ prays in John 17, he says, he says in 17, he says, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. So that goes back to the preexistence of Christ, uh, his eternality, that he had a glory with the Father, that he shared heaven in perfect unity with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, and yet he gives up his glory and his majesty. The robes of heaven for the swaddling clothes of the manger. 
Amen? He gives up his glory. One of the other ways that he abandons his sovereign position is that he lays aside his personal authority. He still has authority. He has the authority. Christ said, the reason my father loves me is that I lay, that, I lay down my life only to take it up again. I have the authority to lay it down. I have the authority to take it up. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I had that authority, but he lays down his authority. He gives up his life willingly. A few years ago, Prof and I had an uh, interfaith meeting with some on-campus Muslims. And one of the questions by one of those guys was, you can't kill God. You can't kill. How can Jesus die if he's God? And the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life on my own accord. No one takes it from me. I lay it down and I take it up again. Personal authority. But he came to do the father's will. Uh, if, this, if possible, Lord, may, Father, may this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done. He learned obedience through the things that he suffered. John 5, I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, and I, please not to, I seek not to please my own self, but him who sent me. He came to do the Father's will. The third point here under him abandoning or laying aside his glory, he sets aside, a volunteer, he sets aside his voluntary display of divine attributes. And those go, go back to what I mentioned a while ago, his omnipotence. You know, Christ got hungry. He got really sleepy. You know, I, I heard a commentator say one time, well, you know, did, you know, baby Jesus, he probably never cried. Oh, he cried. He was a baby. He had humanity. He was fully God and fully man. But he laid aside his display, voluntary display of divine attributes. He laid aside his eternal riches. 2 Corinthians 8, Paul, Paul says that you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he's rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. So here we have Christ in the riches of heaven, in the glory of heaven, and he comes down and he takes on a life of poverty so that we might be rich and drive a Lexus. Is that what that means? A new Silverado? No, that we might be rich spiritually. Christ, in another way that he sets aside his sovereign position, is he suffers the wrath of God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Isaiah said it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. It was God's will to crush his own son and cause him to suffer. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Christ here, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing. And that phrase there, taking the very nature of a servant, is the word doulos, servant, doulos, and it means slave. He took, takes the nature of a slave and that's the ultimate in humility. There is no really Greek word that gives a good rendering for the word bondservant. Your translation may say bondservant. Mine says servant. He took the nature of a slave, <laughs> our baby in the manger, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but made himself nothing and he accepted, that's the second point, he accepted a slave's place, doulos. What did Christ say? Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. The Son of Man did not come to, serve, but to be served, but to serve. And what? Give his life as a ransom for many. He laid down his life like a humble slave. A slave to God, the Father. The next point is that he associated with sinful men. He was made in human likeness. He was found in the appearance of a man. You know, we get them in the form, being in the very nature of God up in verse 6, it's morphe. He's in the very nature of God. He, had all the he has all the characteristics of God. He always has and he always will. 
But he's found in the appearance of a man. That's the word schema. On the outside, he looks like a man. He's got a body. He appeared in the body, as Paul told Timothy. Being made in human likeness, Isaiah said he was numbered with the transgressors. He was counted as if he were a sinner. He took on a life of poverty. It says he has no, Isaiah says he has no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him, for he was despised and rejected by men. Isaiah also says that he grew up before the watchful eye of the Father. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground, Isaiah 53 says. The humility of Christ, the humble beginnings of Christ. What did Christ say? Birds have nests, foxes have holes. The Son of Man, what? Has no place to lay his head. He takes on poverty and he's associated with sinful man. He takes on humanity, he takes on the appearance, the appearance of man, and yet he's without sin. He has no sin. Verse 8, being found of appearance of a man, he humbled himself. And here we see the humility of Christ. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Um, I read a comment here recently about historians. Historians would say that anyone who died on a cross died a thousand deaths. It's the most disgraceful, humiliating, painful way that a person could die. But he came obe became obedient to death. He humbled himself. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. He humbled himself to the point of death, even death, even death on a cross. Isaiah said he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a, slam, a lamb to the slaughter, and yet he did not open his mouth. Humility. Peter said when reviled, when reviled, he did not revile in return. Is that humility? What if you'd read in your Bible... And Jesus, spitting back, <laughs> he humbled himself. So here's the creator of the universe who, when reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. What did he do? He committed himself to God the Father. He committed himself to the one who judges righteously. The humility of Christ, he humbled himself and became obedient. And the last point here, therefore... We see the exaltation of Christ, the elevation of Christ. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that is the name that he receives. He is Lord. He's sovereign to the glory of God the Father. Hebrews 1 says that after providing purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty of heaven. He's exalted to the highest heavens. Uh, he's given the nations when he returns as his inheritance. It's part of his exaltation. All things are put under his feet. He's given the right to judge. John says, he says in John that the Father judges no one. He's entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. He's exalted to the highest place. And he sits down at the right hand. And what does he do for us at the right hand of the majesty in heaven? He makes intercession for us. He pleads for us and he pleads our case with God the Father. The name above every name, that it, the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And I think this is very timely for today because it says in heaven and on earth... And under the earth. So those in heaven now bow their knee to Christ. We here on earth as believers bow our knee to Christ. And those under the earth, those in judgment, those in hell will bow their knees to Christ and confess with their tongue that Jesus Christ is Lord. Um, you know, one of the things you see often in the scriptures that Paul closes with judgment in his sermons. You see a judgment coming. But even in Revelation 20, when the books are open and at the judgment of the wicked dead, the haughty and the prideful and those who 
reject Christ will still have to bow their knee to Christ and confess that, yes, Jesus, you are Lord. You, you are Lord of all. To the glory of God the Father, and that's why he did it, ultimately. You've heard me use this term before, that our world... And even the church is a smaller arena, but our world is an arena and a display case for the attributes of God and for His glory. Um, we see God's glory in His work in the world, uh, even in tragedy. The tragedies that we see happen in our culture, we see the glory of God and how He works in that. We see, you know, some people may say that, you know, how can you see the glory of God in a tsunami? where many people are killed. But we see the glory of God's wrath in our world today. His wrath is glorified in judgment of sinful man, but His mercy and His love and His patience and His kindness are glorified in the salvation of us sinners. Christ did all of this ultimately to the glory of God the Father. And that's the word doxa. It's where we get our word doxology where we sing to God and we glorify His name and we lift up the opinion of our God. Glorify means to lift up the opinion of our God. So as Christ has humbled Himself, that He takes on the nature of a servant, He's made in human likeness, He humbles Himself and becomes obedient to death, even death on a cross, and God exalts Him to the highest place and He sits down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, and every knee in heaven and on earth and every... And under the earth, every tongue confesses that he is Lord. To the, they do it to the glory of God the Father and to the glorification of God the Father. Um, what's the song we sing at Christ, Christmas? Uh, in excelsis Deo. Isn't there a line about the glory of God in that song? We sing about, We just sing a Christmas song about the glory of God. Christ did this for the glory of God the Father, and it flies in the again, once again, in the face of our culture that think that, that maybe God this, did this for our own glory, but guess what? Ultimately, he did it for the glory of God the Father, but we do share in, in God's glory in the kingdom. That we'll have glorified bodies like Christ. John says that we shall be like Christ, for we shall see him as he is. And there is a glorification of the believer. And that just gives us another reason to praise God at Christmas time that he sent his son as a payment for our sins, even though he did it ultimately for his own glory and for the glory of the God, the God the Father, we get glorified bodies out of the deal and we get heaven. And in this, we greatly rejoice. Um, we're going we're gonna to take communion here, but I just want us to, to pray here. I'm going to lead us in prayer, and I just want you to spend a few moments in prayer contemplating on the humility of Christ that he humbled himself, and I want you to think back to yourself if there have been times when you haven't been humble. I want you to think back to times maybe where you have not been humble, and then I want you to contemplate and meditate on the humility of Christ, and that's how we ought to leave here today. That's not saying we're not joyful. Absolutely. Those are two separate terms, joy, joyful, and being humble. But I want you to contemplate your own humility and then compare it to the humility of Christ. There is no comparison. But let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you again that you sent your son, that he humbled himself and became obedient to death. Forgive us, Lord, for when we're prideful, for when we're not humble. For when we boast, Lord, may we not boast in anything but, but you, Lord, and of knowing Christ and the cross of Christ. How could we ever be boastful of our salvation, but we can rejoice. Lord, I pray that we would be a humble people, that we would not fall for what the world says, being full of pride, being full of self-esteem that we would not esteem ourselves more highly than we ought Lord I pray that we would look to the greatest example your son the greatest example of humility and may we remember that Lord when we see a, a nativity scene 
May we remember what Christ did, that he humbled himself. Y'all just spend just a few moments in prayer. The uh, ushers would come forward, we'll uh, take up an offering. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you and worship you with our giving, Father. We thank you for this time of year. We thank you for Jesus Christ and the coming of the birth and the celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ. We thank you for uh, Pastor Lacan. We ask you to bless him and his family. We ask you to bless our body of elders, Fred and Andrew. And Rex, and especially lift up Rex and Stacy at this time, and the Stevenson family. Father, we've been able to worship you by hearing your word preached and proclaimed. We've been able to worship you through our music. And Father, now we get to worship you by our giving, Father. We thank you for the prayer warriors of this church. Just uh, continue to bless this church. Bless this community in the surrounding area. Bless our missionaries that we support. Protect them, Father. Father, again, we thank you for this time of giving. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and we pray in his name. Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and mild and sweet their songs repeat of peace on earth, good will to men. And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, good will to men. Then rang the bells more loud and deep, God is not dead, nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, good will to man. With peace on earth, good will to man. Thank you. 
Thank you, guys. We're going to take a uh, communion here, and I just want to uh, read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And these are the words of Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And then Paul gives a warning. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. For we, if we have judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. But when we are judged, we are chastised by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. So, Paul gives a warning that our attitude when we take the Lord's Supper should be a time of confession and then remembering what Christ has done for us. If you're harboring any sin in your heart or anything against your brother or sister, you need to deal with God and use this time that we pray uh, to confess that before the Lord. The way we do it here at College Hills, if... If you're a believer, maybe not a member of our church, you're welcome uh, to partake of the Lord's table. We ask that if you're not a believer, or if you, maybe if you had a child that's not a believer, that you use this as a teaching moment, that they don't partake of it, but that you teach them um, with your family what you're doing. If, if you've got anybody that, here that doesn't have anybody partake of communion with, uh, I would ask that our church members would reach out to them and we pray together. But what we'll do is we'll use a short time to, to pray and to con use it as confession and then remembering what Christ has done. And then families come up here and we ask the dads or whoever to, uh, to lead the families. And uh, if you need somebody to take communion with you, just grab somebody, okay? But let's use this time as, re as reflection.
Uh, would y'all stand with me? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you again for Christmas. Lord, I pray that you would be with us as we leave here today, Lord. We pray that you would deliver us from sin and evil, from harm. May we humble ourselves, Lord, and walk in humility as we try to be more like your son, Lord. Conform us into the image of Christ. In his name, amen. Y'all have a good week. Merry Christmas.